you very much for coming out to support Sevastopol Historical Society. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the members of the Historical Society. Uh, as all good causes, we're going to ask for donations in our free will donation basket. This is just like church. We operate on everybody's good graces, so appreciate any, anything that's forthcoming. We're consistently looking for program topics and speakers. Uh, that's what keeps this organization rolling. And if you have a family history that you'd like to share or you have a topic that you'd like researched and, and done, we would be more than happy to have you present it or at least come up with uh, a program that addresses topics. Uh, anything you can imagine with the history of Sevastopol is, is fair game. I'd like to announce that we have Sevastopol stories available for purchase. Uh, a large book of stories that were written by residents of the town of Sebastopol. Very popular book. Well, obviously, the, the uh, story tonight is the history of Lily Bay. And if you don't know where Lily Bay is, it's on the end of uh, County T, just before you get to Lake Michigan. Michigan. So, so I'm I'm take, take, I take it this, this is one of the, one of the uh, original, original buildings. buildings. So, so Lily, Lily Bay was established, was established in the late 1880s, I believe. I believe. I don't, I don't know. You're the expert. No, I'm not an expert. 1886. Um, um, we, had we had a store, a store down, there. down there. We had, we had uh, about, about 12, 12 families. families. Um, a, sawmill, a sawmill. A pier. A pier. Fishing. fishing lumbering, lumbering. Shingle, shingle making. Very right, long, long pier. pier. Um, um, oh, and oh, these and photos, these photos are, compliments are compliments of Carol, Carol Wester. Wester. I, believe I believe Carol is here, is here tonight. tonight, correct? Correct. Carol. Carol. So thank, so you, thank very you very much, very much for, for um, um, for providing, providing these, these uh, black, and black and whites, whites to, document to document the history of Lily Bay. Lily Bay. Um, um, there were millions, millions and millions, and millions of board, board feet, feet in lumber, in lumber that, that went, went off, off the Lily Bay pier in that. 1800s, 1800s and early 1900s. 1900s. So this so is this just, is a, just small a small sample, sample of, of uh, wood, that, wood was that was there throughout, throughout the season. season. Mostly, Mostly manual, manual labor, labor I, would I, would say. I would say. Or some, or horsepower, some horsepower, probably. probably. Mm -hmm. um, this, um, this is some is kind of planer, planer or deep barker. Maybe, somebody, Maybe somebody, somebody can help me with these, these photos, photos because, because I really I don't. Really don't, really don't know. Don't know. Anybody, Anybody wish, wish to, offer to offer some, some input, input on, on what's on going, on going on here? On here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, are, uh, these are these all, all Smith, Smith boys? boys? Western, Western boys? boys? Anybody, Anybody know who's, who's in this in picture? This picture? Ted, Western right. Ted Western on the far right. Ted right. Grandpa John, John Wester. Wester. All right. All right. Okay. All, right. All right. And the and gentleman, the gentleman who looks, looks like he has, like he a, has tie a tie on, on and a and postman's, postman's cap. cap. Who would that, who would be? that be? Anybody, Anybody know? Anybody know? Second, Second one, from, one the from, the from the left. All right. And you all thought wall drug was in South Dakota. Well, it's right here in the town of Sebastopol. It's a franchise. <laughs> it's a franchise, Laddie says. And there again, uh, that's got to be a slab, cutting slabs. They cut the edge off the log for. Yes. Oh, that big sl saw blade. Mm -hmm. Some slabs or lumber taken off the outside. It's referred to as a cant. It's a, a, a log on the carriage. And then they can set whatever thickness they want, or? Right. From there, the sawyer would probably drop it down on that flat and then start sawing lumber off the outside. If you notice, the other side is flat as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that dimension, probably looking at it, I'm guessing probably 12 inch. And he'd drop it down now and then start taking 12 inch lumber off. And the fellow sitting on the log on the left there smiling, he pushes them down towards the 
towards the end of the... Um, well, I, would, I would guess that he would be called an off-bearer, taking the lumber off as it came off the mill, taking the lumber. But I would think Hap would have that pretty well explained. All right, again, here's another photo of the lily bay. Notice that lily has two L's in it. And if you look on the map now, there's just one L. And we all know that um, it was originally called St. Joseph's. And uh, after Mr. Joseph, and he decided to change it to Lily Bay in honor of his daughter named Lily. And these are? Ted Wester and Ralph Smith. Okay. Oh, and this is the Lily Bay Orchestra. So <laughs> notice again, Lily is spelled with two L's. And um, we did a little research. We found uh, there really was a Lily Bay Orchestra. And they traveled throughout Door County. They were in high demand, um, this band. And the names of the fellows were? Um, the band was made up of George Klum, K-L-U-M-B, Alexis Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R, Arthur Herbold, and Albert Kimber. And like I said, um, they played, let's see, on Thursday, October 21st in 1909, they were playing at the Grand Ball in Fish Creek. And I found a lot of entries where they played in Bailey's Harbor, Egg Harbor. And this is probably the Smith Brothers again. All right. Are those lake trout? Brown trout. The big one is catch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a nice catch. <laughs> And this fellow is? Okay. And another view of all of the saw logs. And there we are, back to the beginning. All right. Thank you for bearing with me. I didn't know I was going to be commenting on all these photos. <laughs> okay. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Hap Smith, who is going to present the history of Lily Bay, Wisconsin. Thank you very much for the audience today. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I had some uh, horn run off this morning, and I thought, well, how many people are there going to be here? And I thought, well, you know, it'll be 25. And then uh, I said, I'll run an extra 10. So I ended up with 35 of these. And with this, this audience of you folks coming to hear this has been just tremendous. Uh, to put any of your minds at rest, I am Ralph Smith's brother. Uh, that's my uh, easiest introduction to anybody uh, because uh, everybody knew Ralph and everybody enjoyed Ralph and he was the fixture of Billy Bay. And uh, if I ever have any trouble identifying myself with anybody in Door County, after we've talked a little while, I uh, say, well, I'm Ralph Smith's brother. Oh, yes, I've immediate friendship develops. <laughs> so it's a real, uh, uh, real neat thing. Um, I, I've enjoyed um, getting ready for this talk because our farm was just a mile from Lily Bay, and we knew the Wester family, the Gronfeld family, very well. And you could always, uh, uh, our parents were great believers in uh, neighbors. They always told us that you should uh, take care of your neighbors, get along well with your neighbors. You can get along without your relatives, but you can't get along without your neighbors. <laughs> so this was uh, uh, why we enjoyed Lily Bay, the Wester family and the families there. 
And we wanted, uh, in getting ready for this, I thought of the times of the United States and what it was like uh, at that period of time, starting 1850. And the United States was a very, very busy place. It was the, uh, the people were taking the resources. They, they felt the, this uh, manifest destiny. The resources were there and they were moving. They had settled out along the coast and uh, a lot of the resources of the New England area and so on had been depleted. And now in the 1870s and the 1880s, the people were moving west. And Door County was an excellent place for them because they had resources, there were trees to cut, there were farmlands to develop, and the people were coming here. Uh, the immigration pattern in Door County from the 1875 to 1885 was one of a majority of the people had been born in the United States. 60% of the people that immigrated to Door County at that time had been born in the United States and about 20% of them were German immigrants and about 20% were Scandinavian uh, immigrants. And this reminded me really of a, a, a story of my grandchildren. Uh, when they, about five of them approached me one day and they said to me, Grandpa, can you speak Wisconsin? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no. I can't speak Wisconsin, I've been gone too long, but I know some people that can, and I uh, mentioned some names. And they said, well, we know they can speak Wisconsin. <laughs> but it's, it was a mixture of languages of the people coming here that have that slight dialect on the thing. The, uh, another instance with uh, grandchild, uh, just recently, uh, they, when they were home about three weeks ago, uh, they got out my album of, uh, or the yearbook in 1943, and they were going through it and having a great time. I graduated from up here at a half block, and uh, one of them came up in all seriousness. He had found the picture of the football team. And I'm sitting there in front with Bob Urban. And then he came over to me and he said, uh, Grandpa, when you played football, did they have numbers on their jerseys? <laughs> <laughs> so it's been a delightful thing. The um, lumbering in Door County uh, was true in, and it was typical in many places. Door County did not have the rivers that many areas that uh, lumbered had. There were no rivers that they could run the uh, logs down, and any logs that were harvested in the interior uh, had to be brought down by sled, usually sled, they liked the sleds better, and brought to the shore. And that's where the sawmills were. There were about 52 uh, piers scattered around the shores of, of uh, Door County. And there were 50 sawmills scattered in that area, too. That's where the business was. So many of these people that worked and uh, became timber barons, and a few of them kept their money, but the others were always on the buy. They would log something off, they would harvest it, 
they would sell it, but use the money to buy the next one, the next one, thinking it would never end. And it did end. And of course, it didn't replenish itself. Like if you planted a field of corn, the next year you can go back. If you sowed all the trees, the next year it was all stump land and so on. And that's what happened. They harvested everything, and if they didn't have an auxiliary business, they were almost penniless. And that's what occurred in some of the cases. I had a great uncle that lived in Jacksonport, and he was known as the Cedar King, Joe Smith, the Cedar King. But he did the very thing I mentioned. He would harvest for 40 acres, he would leave the month, uh, area, go back to taxes, and he'd buy another one, he'd harvest that and harvest that. And when he ran out of 40-acre things, he was bankrupt, really. He tried farming, he didn't like farming, and then he uh, heard of the uh, logging they were doing up by St. Ignatius, and he packed up his uh, wife and family and they went up to that area, but the second time through, it was a different story. He knew why he didn't have the money. And so when he set up camp, this time he had the store, he had the blacksmith shop, he had the feed store for the cattle and the horses, and he had all of the businesses in his camp, and these are the ones that survived. We have in Door <laughs> County a few of the people that did that in New England, and when the, the crops in the tree truck crop in New England was completely out, they knew about Door County and they came up here. And the Washburn family, the the ones the precursors of. Yonkers and Frangies and Frangie Washburn and then the L.M. Washburn store. They were lumbermen in the east. The Schofield family, they had the hardware store in downtown Sturgeon Bay, were lumbermen in the east and they came, but they realized that if they were going to survive, they had to come, that the lumber wasn't going to last forever. But anyway, there was one that was quite different. There was a Mr. Maschak, M-A-S-H-C-K, or E-K. Uh, he was uh, from Kiwani. And all of the time in Door County, he was just quietly coming up here and buying land. And he was buying land and he was buying land. And one of the first times that he was made in the news uh, the Advocate News, he had purchased 2,000 acres of land up around Clark's Lake. Uh, Mr. Clark had passed away, and his heirs didn't really care about the trees or the fisheries that Clark had, John Clark had, and so Matzak added that to his. And at that point, some of you may have the set of maps that look like this, if you look at the top of that on that, uh, about four or five miles from uh, County, what is now County Chunchi, and where it comes out to Lily Bay, Matchek had bought all of that land along the shore, and he turned around then and bought all the land through Glidden Drive, past Whitefish Bay, up around the uh, uh, Whitefish Dunes Park and up around there. And he had all of it, that land. Didn't have a sawmill, he had a shingle mill, but he didn't have a sawmill at that point. And you're wondering, uh, you know, what's he going to do? Well, Mr. Matchek was a banker, a banker in Kiwani. Uh, his father was president of the Kiwani Bank, and he was one of the board of directors. Another of the board of directors was his brother, and 
there were two other members on that board. Now, when you've got three votes on the board of directors of a bank, it isn't hard to get money to buy things, you see. <laughs> so that, that's what he was doing, and he was buying these. Uh, but he still didn't have a sawmill. Well, bankers have a way of knowing that uh, things are going downhill for some people. And there were three sawmills in Sturgeon Bay. There was the Bradley and Crandall, is by Little Lake, where Sturgeon Bay started. There was the Burke uh, sawmill in the middle of the city, and there was the Grave sawmill up by where Peterson and the fruit growers were. Well, he went down there and he bought the Bradley Crandall mill. And he moved that out to Lily Bay. This was a remarkable feat in itself because this wasn't any small mill. When they had sawmills in those days, they were two-story sawmills and they built them and enclosed them completely. And nobody stood out in the open and cut the, all the processing brought the uh, logs up to the second floor, and then they sawed them into lumber, and they would go down through the sawmill uh, to be uh, planers or jointed and this sort of thing. So, Matchak, bought that mill, moved it out to Lully Bay, and set it up on the Grunfeld property, what is now the Grunfeld property. The sawmill was back at the uh, point before the creek, and some of you that may know uh, that area, notice before you get to the high, high mark on the beach, that there's a dilation it's a little bit bigger, and that's the old mill pond. They put in a, a dam. It was four and a half feet tall. And they dammed the water back. They flooded about 11 acres. Now, just imagine if you were going to try and flood 11 acres of woodlot today. But at any rate, they flooded about 11 acres. The land then adjacent to that and towards what is now County Road T became their area where they would bring the logs in when they wanted to process them. All they had to do was roll them down the hill, put them into the uh, creek, and bring them around to the sawmill and process them there. And uh, uh, Mr. Matchek was quite a businessman. He realized when he got the sawmill, and he had the shingle mill, and he enclosed that as well in the uh, building, that he had to have help. And so he didn't have any direct heirs, so he convinced his nephew that he should come into business with him. And so he gave him he gave them a banker giving. He gave them one third of the a, a business at uh, Lily Bay that he should stay there and manage it. And so he had him move, and his name was Charles. And so on the maps, you'll see it as V and C Matchek. His name was Charles, and he moved up here and brought his uh, wife up here as well. You can imagine coming from K Kiwani, where the streets were fairly well paved and all the conveniences of the city at that time, she moved in out at Lily Bay. Um, the, um, so at any rate, uh, he continued to uh, uh, do that. He'd come up about every two weeks or so and he would uh, check things over, like stay here four or five days, something like that. But uh, he would uh, stay here at that time. But he was a different person. 
Uh, he had businesses before he started in the lumber company. He owned three schooners, the lumberman, the young Rand, and the Lizzie Metzner. And of course, he thought in terms of keeping these schooners busy hauling lumber, and he did. And they hauled things uh, for, um, and his market was established in the Chicago and Milwaukee area. So he had three, three schooners that he could use to move the material. He knew the businessmen. His nephew knew the businessmen in Milwaukee and Chicago. And the more they could uh, market, the better off they were. And he had uh, plans to uh, uh, market, uh, well, they had plans in the first year to saw four to five million board feet of lumber. And that's enough to build about 40 houses in that house, 40 to 60 houses. And they were going to get that out. And I, I wouldn't be surprised with what they did. He hired um, initially about 20 men to work in the woods. And he ha would have another crew of about 20 men working on the sawmills. At one time, he had 40 people working in the woods cutting. Now, shortly before they started to saw this, uh, or before they started to harvest, there was a major change in the ability to harvest the limb timber. Before 1875, if you were going to harvest a tree, you would, axemen would go out to the tree, they would chop the tree down, and after the tree was chopped down, then they would start to saw it up in 16-foot sections and saw the limbs off or something like that. And about in 1775, Henry Diston had in his catalog the new saw, the new crosscut saw, and this one had rakers. Before, if you used the old cross crosscut saw, the sawdust would always jam in the cut, and you couldn't get it done. But after 1875, the new distance saw came out, and you could cut in a horizontal direction. Once that came, the trees really started to fall. Two people could walk up to a tree, saw through it on a horizontal, and down it would come. And the people who used to be axemen uh, and choppers were learning how to saw. So that was one of the major changes in the logging situation, and it was exercised here in uh, Lily Bay. The, um, I have some notes here, and I'll briefly mention those about uh, evidence of uh, the sawing here in um, the, um, the, I think it's been established pretty well how many buildings you have, but it's the usual curves of uh, the blacksmith shop, the store, and so on. But the other thing that occurred here in uh, Lily Bay was wherever there was a pier, the companion industry that worked off of that pier were the fishermen. Uh, in Whitefish Bay, there were fishermen. Uh, in Fish Creek, there were fishermen, all of them working off 
the logging piers. And these long logging piers were, oh, a quarter of uh, the one at uh, Lily Bay was about a quarter of a mile out. The one that uh, Horn had at Horn's Pier in the southern door uh, was a third of a mile out. There was an optimum distance in which you could put those piers. First of all, they had to be in deep enough water. Secondly, they had to be built well enough to withstand the storms and the ice shove and be serviceable. And it had to have a rectangular area at the end that when you went out with a team of horses, you would have room to turn around with a team and wagon and return down to the farm. And all of the piers were built like that. Now, Mr. Horn, who was in Southern Door, and did not have a great deal of success because he built a, a pier that was about a third of a mile long, and he was in a strong current area. And year after year, he would have to rebuild that pier. And that was part of, the, of doing business, was rebuilding the pier to try and stay in business as far as uh, the Lily Bay Pier was quite durable, and only occasionally would they write about it. And their biggest problem was the ice shows that it had. Um, thing. Okay, the first official mention of the uh, Dort of uh, Lily Bay. And it was in the, the application for a post office. Uh, they wanted to have a post office in Lily Bay. And in that post office, uh, they had to find a place. And the application tells about, basically, it would have been on County Trunk T and Lake Forest Drive right now. It was in the midst of the swamp that was created by the uh, Lily Bay Creek, but I think that they did have it for about three years, and it would almost have to be in the store uh, at Lily Bay. Many of these things, the one at Institute was in the, the tavern here uh, across the street. Uh, occasionally there would be one in a home, but I think in uh, for Lily Bay in the short period of time it had it probably was in the uh, store. Uh, it said in the application in, for the pier or for the post office that it would serve about 25 people in um, Lily Bay. And it would serve about 200 people in the adjacent area. Many times people that lived in the adjacent area would work in the lumber, uh, lumbering business, and so it was a large uh, thing. I, I'm constantly revising this thing because <laughs> I have to. Okay, the, um, um, they drew up plans for the building of a um, three houses and a, um, a, a, a lodge. The lodge was right across the, all of Matchek's buildings were in the south part, uh, south side of that street, and that would have been the Sturgeon Bay Township. There was a lodge. And that lodge uh, was a very attractive building. It persisted up into the um, uh, 30s when it was dismantled and moved and rebuilt. Um, 
the uh, Roosevelt family owned the land at that time, and they uh, used the lodge for summer vacations. And uh, John's father, uh, John uh, Roosevelt, would uh, come up with high school students, bike from Japir, and then uh, stay there for a while. And of course, we were the closest one for for eggs and uh, milk, and so they would be frequently up here as well. The um, oh yes, it, uh, at times, at times, magic had as high as fifty people working there in the, in the woods, besides the uh, lumber. So it was a, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, thing, and the. Um, they had an advertising system, and it, uh, it was a store, uh, store advertising that they would uh, have in the advocate, and a rather traditional advertisement. And in that advertisement, uh, they would have uh, get everything into it. They, they would have uh, dry goods at the store, they would have uh, lumber supplies, uh, posts, things like that. And one of the things they, well, I'll get back to that, uh, shingles, posts, wood, and bark. One of the things that they sold here um, in this area was bark. It was hemlock bark. And when I first heard about Hemlock Park, I wondered what they were talking about. But they would cut down the hemlock trees, and they grew well along the shore and inland. They would cut them into various lengths, and then uh, strip them. They'd let them dry, and then they would strip the bark off. And they would sell the bark by the cord. This is a full cord, the, the four foot high, four foot wide, and eight feet long. And I thought, why are they selling hemlock bark? And it turned out that they had a cycle of business here. They would sell the wood, the logs, cut them into railroad ties, they would sell the ties down to Chicago, and of course, what was occurring there, they were building the railroads to the west. And so the ties from Lily Bay would go out on the railroad to extend the railroad. The railroad, the bark from these trees would be uh, squeezed the juice would be taken out, and it would be the tannins. And what did they use the tannins for? They used the tannins for tanning the hides. So they had built in the railroads out to the west. The ranchers were sending the cattle back to Chicago, and they were being slaughtered, and the hides were being tied. And of course, the money was coming back up to Lily Bay from the, both of those things. It, it was remarkable. The other thing that they had a big market for were telephone poles, cedar telephone poles. And Matchek had to put in his own telephone from Sturgeon Bay to Lily Bay. But they, it cost them about $20 a mile. And they thought it was a bargain because they had communication with Sturgeon Bay. And later, when he was working 
uh, with Sister Bay and had a store there. He had he put a line from Sturge, from Lily Bay to Sister Bay. It was and so their um, store went like that. The <clears throat> an interesting thing occurs here as, as the trees are cut down and the material diminishes, Magic again sees what's going to happen. And so he starts developing material at Whitefish Bay. He owns the area by Whitefish Bay. He owns the area by Clark Lake. He starts developing that, and he develops the store there. He develops the blacksmith shop there, and everything that you would need for the sawmill. And then, on, get this date. Mm -hmm. uh, about 86, 1886, uh, the uh, advertisement do not show that there is a mill at Lily Bay. They moved the mill from there to uh, Whitefish Bay, and they put it right up by the Whitefish Bay Creek, just like he did here uh, with the Lily Bay Creek. Uh, put it up by the Whitefish Bay Creek. He probably put a dam in there where they could look at. And for about a year and a half or two years, they cut the timber at Whitefish Bay. There was nothing left to cut down in the Lily Bay area. So the industry that was left then was fishing. Fishing was a little bit different. And this is where we used the building that is still there. If you can imagine, that building was probably built in the 18, 1880s or something like that. It was a coopering shop. Uh, Clark had several of those shops uh, up around uh, Clark's Lake, and there was this one in Sturgeon Bay. And if you go in the sawmill headquarters, and look up at the ceiling, you'll notice that all of the boards are darkened. And the reason they're darkened is that there's two phases of coopering and making barrels that where you have to have a fire on the floor. One, when you start making them, you steam them so you can bend the wood and put the hoops on it. And so there's a fire in the coopering shop for that. And then the second one is when you've got the barrel done and they do what they call toasting, they burn the inside of the barrel. So that left a mark in that building that we have today, that this was the coopering shop. But the coopering and shipping of fish that they would catch, and they had a system uh, basically, um, they gill netted. Um, the uh, ones, the writers that uh, did uh, talk about it, and uh, they want to be have a euphemistic approach, they go ahead and say, well, they say no. But if you're, they were truthful, as they gill netted them. They would hire uh, Clark in, at, up at Ron Clark's Lake, and this is out in Lake Michigan now. They'd put in two piles, two posts. They would put a net between those. And some of those nets were um, 40, 40 yard, uh, rods. That's 16 and a half to a foot. So you're, we're talking 100, 100 uh, uh, feet, up to 400 feet. They got a lot of fish in those barrels. And they would leave them out for a couple days, bring them in, pull them up on shore, and harvest the white fish. 
the white fish is what they wanted to. They put them in the barrels and ship them, and the rest of the fish would go for fertilizer on the farms. They could hire Native Americans in the area to carry those things out, and there were fertilizer on local farms. The most of the fish from <clears throat> from Lily Bay and Whitefish Bay went to Chicago. Uh, they were had contacts there, but some of the other areas. Uh, Gills Rock, Washington Island. Washington Island would ship directly to Cleveland in some areas. They, and they, they could put 100 to 150 barrels of fish uh, on these schooners as they uh, passed them. So it, it was a very, very big uh, business. And after a while, of course, like everything else, Market changes, transportation changes. And it, uh, roads were better, and there were buses, or, not buses, trucks, that would carry this uh, material for them rather than have to depend on the barrels and so on. And so what did the little cooper shop become? It became a box mill. They had an indoor arrangement. They had a saw, saw, saw mill in there, and they made fish boxes. Fish boxes you see around. They have two lugging handles on each end and built, and it could make a single trip like a, a throwaway of wood. So they made, they would uh, ice these fish down, and I remember when we were uh, at the farm and sometimes we were uh, milking the cows in the evening and down the road would come a cloud of dust and in front of it was the fish truck. And who was driving, whose truck was that? It was the butch boatman, you know, travel there. He had a truck that was covered. He would go up to Whitefish Bay and he would cover the three, um, uh, the white, the millers, the uh, tipplers, the loungers pick that up, come back through the back roads, and go down to the Western's fish house and pick up that, and probably got some more, and take off for Milwaukee or in some cases Green Bay. They were getting fresh fish uh, and a, a different change, but again, the little. Uh, Cooper's shop was the one that survived surviving the opportunity for that. Well, of course, time passes, and the industries disappear, but this one of building the fishing boxes, and I can remember many times going down there and hearing uh, Grandpa Wester uh, with a And he was nailing fish boxes. But, and they would sell fish boxes, but finally the market for the fish boxes disappeared as well. And the coopering shop had to change. And it did. The coopering shop, uh, uh, be, um, it was the headquarters of the shed. Ralph Smith and Harold Shop uh, wanted to cut some logs, they built some houses. Um, Ralph wanted to build a cottage down there in Pebble Lane, and so they convinced Ted to get a larger sawmill. And so they had the uh, sawmill that you presently see installed. And Ted Wester operated that for some time, and Ralph and Harold would bring in some logs and uh, they would get uh, their uh, materials sawed. And I think that the wood that, um, in, well, I know the one on uh, near Pebble Lane and the one that Richard lives in uh, and uh, probably others, uh, most of that lumber 
has been sawed by the Lily Bay sawmill uh, that's in front, and Lord knows a lot of other. Um, I had an interesting experience one time with Ralph. After we moved up here, I uh, had to put a new deck on a house that I have. And uh, I was working on it and putting it on, and I'd got most of the two by sixes I needed. And Ralph would be very careful to not plane them completely to leave a few rough areas, but because he didn't want to see these people slipping on the deck. And I had worked myself on Friday around to a point, and I calculated that I needed about six more two by sixes, eight feet long. By the time I got out to the sawmill, uh, I didn't realize it but I was encroaching on break time. <laughs> and Ralph was adamant about break time, so it was about 3.30 in the afternoon, and I visited with him for a short period of time, and then I said, uh, uh, I need about six, two by six, cedar, two by sixes, uh, and could you plane them? Because he had them on the stack, you know. And he looked at me very carefully, and he said, you have to learn something. Anybody that comes out here after 3.30 in the afternoon doesn't get any lumber until Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and I didn't either. I enjoyed the time. And so we have a situation here of uh, times change, the uh, industry change, but the Cooper Shed persists. Probably about 115 years at least, maybe 130. Nobody knows exactly when that Cooper Shed was made. And that Cooper Shed then uh, stayed there. The Cooper Shed watched the big trees fall. It watched the lumber industry come and go. It watched the fishing industry come and go. And each time it adapted to a new business. Each time it was too good a building, built in the 1800s, it always fit the purpose that was needed. It, uh, it watched the tourists uh, um, business develop. And it watched the residential homes in their area come in. And it was the, um, watched the forest regenerate itself. After 60 or 70 years, the forest has regenerated itself. And so the little Cooper shed has been there on that sand dune for a long time, but it has seen and enjoyed many, many experiences. Thank you very much for asking me. If you have any questions, fine. Uh, the, uh, my hearing aid is basically across the card table. <laughs> so what we'll have to do is we'll uh, have to relay uh, the uh, questions. Would you want to come up again? And uh, if there are any questions, you just repeat them to me okay. after you uh, get up. Don't get too far away. Are there any questions? <laughs> No, I think they bring it from Boston. Oh, here. How many of the original buildings from the building do you believe are still there? The five. How many of the original buildings from the little village do you believe are still there? The, uh, the Cooper Shed is the only one. The Cooper Shed, the uh, boarding house, um, left in about the 30s. Um, the, uh, there's, Oh, at Whitefish Bay, the store is there. 
Uh, if you go down into Whitefish Bay, and uh, if you look at it, it looks like a traditional Western store. And that was the type of store that was uh, at uh, Lily Bay as well. Uh, I can remember that store being there. It wasn't occupied, but uh, uh, it was there. So you have the White Whitefish Bay dry goods store or goods uh, store, and you have the Cooper and Shed uh, at uh, Lily Bay. Well, uh, your answer just gave rise to another question. Where where is that Whitefish Bay? And then I have another question. That Let's know where that was at Whitefish Bay. The store. The still oh, the standing. store is right on the main road. Uh, the uh, You come into Whitefish Bay and you keep looking on the right-hand side, and you'll see, uh, I think it's painted brown, and you'll see this building that looks like a Western uh, store. And that's the one. They've just, re in about the last five years, they converted it to a residential uh, facility. I, I, my original question was, could you be a little, tell, where were those 11 acres that got flooded? Okay, I heard that one. <laughs> the, uh, uh, if you take the high bank, you go for, start at the water's edge, Lake Michigan, and walk back on the beach, you come to a high bank there. Yeah. And that's where they put the dam uh, on, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the creek there at uh, Lily Bay, Lily Bay Creek. Right, right. And then if you go back from that, you'll see it. Well, when I was a kid, there was an area about as big as this room. It isn't that big now. Uh, a bulge in the um, uh, creek. And then it carries back toward the bridge. But that was the area where they had the 11 acres. And then the area that's right across from the residence of uh, Sturgeon of uh, uh, Lily Bay across the road. Uh, when I was um, about five years old, that entire area of the Crown Belt property was just sand dunes. And of course, that's where they used to pile the logs and then take them over and just, they could uh, dump them right into the uh, uh, creek there and s sort them down to the sawmill. They'd come around the curve to, in the mill pond and uh, pick them up on the uh, sawmill and uh, elevate them up on an angle up to the uh, place. That's, that's where four of us right here live now <laughs> on the street. <laughs> well, that's, if you look at that, that one area, I was back there about two years ago, and it's still enlarged, but I knew where it was. But go from that high bank. Uh, on the water and work back, and you'll see it start to enlarge. Well, yeah. But that's, that's where the dam was. And they raised the water four and a half feet and flooded the 11 acres. Yeah. Did they ever have any need for the county sheriff to come out and settle things or emergency <laughs> medicine, or did they run people in? accidents to town, or did they ever have a fire department issue out there? Did they have a fire department in the area? Did they have a need for the county sheriff to come out and settle issues? Uh, I don't know of fire departments. Uh, most of the fires at that time were handled by cooperative uh, neighbors, and uh, most of the time they lost the building and saved the chimney. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, I suppose, yes, we had a sheriff there, and uh, we had uh, a game warden uh, that built a cottage out there uh, to check things as well, uh, but uh, 
the fight. I think it, they just didn't want to fire him. Uh, it had, that was, uh, but they did have fires, a uh, brush fire, and this was uh, uh, constant across the Vestibule, uh, where the uh, limbs were cut and left to stand. And there is one article in the Advocate that tells of how there was a fire in the swamp. Now that's the swamp that's on T, uh, just before you go up on the highland there. And there was a fire in the swamp, and it mentioned that it was burning dangerously close to the Mashek property. But the wind changed, and it carried the uh, fire away. And it, um, it's that all 330 wind that comes off of the lake. You could, uh, about 3.30, 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, you could almost time it, that the wind will come in off of Lake Michigan and cool what's ever there. And if those of us in Sturgeon Bay, if we're really lucky, we can even get the breeze in Sturgeon Bay. And that would, uh, that saved them. But they had these fires, and they just cut the trees and left them, and sooner or later, it was going to burn over. Yeah, um, we've got one of the original log cabins on Glidden Drive. Would there be any chance the logs came from the sawmill? It, the original cabins on, on Glidden Drive, would those logs have come from the sawmill? I think it was built around 19. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, there's one uh, that John Grunfeld built, and that's uh, in the, uh, it's not on the drive, but it's on the uh, uh, highland there. Uh, it's, what is that, Shore Drive? It's on Shore Drive. Uh, John built, started building that when he was in college. And uh, if you go back there, I think it's called the Pioneer. And John would uh, uh, come back, and I remember very well that he appeared at the doorstep at the farm, and he was on break at college, and he was coming out there to uh, start cutting logs to build that. And he cut logs in his own area, cedar logs. And, but these are not, uh, you know, that they're just... Uh, well, and he got Reverend Helmick to help him uh, hew the ones out and build them. Uh, but that's, uh, I don't think any of the others are. Um, yeah. Yes? Did they find Indian artifacts, uh, arrowheads, and axe points, and any, any of the older? Did they find artifacts, arrowheads, uh, axe po arrow points, things of that nature? Yes. Um, in about what would be two lots now uh, on the uh, hills up on the sand dunes, uh, again, we're talking about the 30s. Uh, there were a lot of chippings, and there were a lot of uh, uh, oh, uh, pottery, pottery shards uh, in that area. But even by the 30s, most, uh, we never found the arrowheads there. But the people from the uh, Sturgeon Bay, maybe Harry Dankiller, and I think the Neville from the Neville Museum had been there with shovels and screened them. And it was a regular chipping ground. We could find flint chippings, and we could find pottery charts, but nothing in the way of a spearhead or anything like that. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, the pier at Lily Bay, when did that disappear? Were there remnants of the pier remaining when you were a boy? Uh, no. The uh, question about the pier. Uh, no, there wasn't. Uh, the access to the water there was the Wester's uh, fishing dock and their hoist. Uh, the pier, if you if you're, have one of these things, you look at it, it's right at the end of the road. It's marked at the end of the road. It may have been a little bit north, but 
they wanted to put it uh, so it was uh, access. They could come down that sand dune there and uh, go out on the pier. Uh, and uh, people have said they have seen uh, timbers from what might be the pier, uh, but they could have been moved too. Uh, we had, um, the, oh yes, I wanted to tell you, the, um, that pier was used for quite a while and uh, it persisted into, uh, I think, 1884 or later. And uh, the steel that was uh, brought up to build the old railroad swing bridge, not the present uh, steel bridge, but the one that preceded it, all of that steel was brought up. The canal wasn't available. All of that steel was brought up, unloaded at that point, and they uh, got teams of horses and sleds. And I think they had something between 12 to 16 teams of horses and drivers uh, unloading that steel from the ship and they would take it the six miles into Sturgeon Bay. Now the straight road on T wasn't available because you, uh, the swamp was so treacherous. So they took what's now Lily Bay Road and that angling road over from T to TG. And they would go up and down around the curves. And the reason that road goes up and down around the curves it's an old Indian trail. It started as an Indian trail, and then pioneers used it, and pretty soon it became a road. But they, all the steel from the old swing bridge, railroad bridge, came across uh, the Dor Lily Bay Pier on into Sturgeon Bay. Yeah. What they, uh, did the Sturgeon Bay Ship Canal how did that affect Lily Bay when it started operating about 1880? The, the Sturgeon Bay Ship Canal, when it started operating, what was the effect on Lily Bay? When the uh, Sturgeon Bay Ship Building, or Sturgeon Bay Ship Canal, was built, it cut down on the summer traffic a great deal. People could come in, but they were still people who would prefer not to fool with that, and they would come to Lily Bay. Uh, we were the, at Lily Bay, we were the winter port for Sturgeon Bay. And during the winter months, when the ice, uh, when the canal was frozen, uh, the, the ship would come to uh, uh, Lily Bay, and they uh, would unload there, and they continued to do that for quite a while. Well, thank you very much. It's been a wonderful <laughs> audience. Okay, uh, it's getting on later on in the night, so we're going to try to speed things up here. We're going to be passing out strawberry dessert uh, in the next few minutes. So uh, sorry for the interruptions, but in order to keep this a little bit timely, we're going to start the video right now, Laddie. Uh, interview with Ralph Smith.
Hello, this is Dennis Conley, your den at the door, and I'm having the delightful afternoon of being with Mr. Ralph Smith, uh, also known as Smitty, here at the Lily Bay um, uh, Sawmill. And it's quite a historical place. It's quite a beautiful place. It's picturesque. It certainly has plenty of personality. And uh, Ralph, you are the proprietor of this sawmill presently. Uh, how long have you uh, uh, been the proprietor, the owner? Well, I started out here in 79 when I retired. And uh, I learned the business from Ted Wester for the 10 years before that. I helped him saw a lot. And, and some of it bound to rub off on you. So that's um, how I got started in it. I always did like it and worked in the woods and you learn a little over the years. Well, I guess you've had plenty of years, uh, good, healthy, happy years to, to learn your trade. Um, th this particular sawmill, where did the uh, saw apparatus, which we'll be featuring later, where did that originally come from, Ralph? Well, that came, um, Ted bought it as a used mill from Weckler's out by the Y Inn, and it was old then. And it's quite a bit older now. And what is the engine that you use to run it? We use a Minneapolis Moline that was in a landing craft in World War <laughs> II. <laughs> is that diesel or gas? Gas. Gas. Yeah. Does that require much maintenance? Very little. Excellent. And does uh, change oil and put gas in it, and that's about all the minimum of care and. Mm -hmm. She's uh, been good to us. And the blade itself, which we'll see later, the blade, is there a story behind it? Those are, uh, we got two of them. One is a 46, and the other one is a 48, I think. There's two blades with insert teeth. They're right behind us here. I'll show them to you. And uh, we uh, replace the teeth in those blades about once a year if... You have good luck, <laughs> but if the nails are around, well, then we replace them more often. Uh, too, uh, too, too bad for that when that happens. Not a good, not a good thing. So you produce dimensional lumber here, and you also produce firewood. And I know you have a great market for firewood. Uh, you've supplied a lot of people uh, throughout this area who, because of you, enjoy the the warmth of the fireplace and uh, probably think of you every time they light the fire. Yeah, I had one of them, uh, doctor in town. He said, he says, I'm going to have a lot of time to think about you. He says, he took four load, five loads of wood. Wow. And uh, he used it to primary heat for his house. Oh, wow. That's, that's ambitious. Yeah. So the, the kind of wood that you mill here, what species do you, what do you work with? One, the biggest one is cedar. That's the one we, we have the most call for. And uh, for decks and porches and uh, a lot of uh, outside work, then that'll live the, exist the longest as far water and, and outside weather, cedar will take it. Yeah. And we do saw some pine too. We don't saw as much pine as we used to because there isn't a demand for it that there used to be. How about uh, how about the birch or the maple that we find here? Well, the birch, we saw that into um, uh, four by sixes for uh, marine travel lift. Oh, and the pine, the big pine, we saw into ten by twelves, and that goes to marine travel lift for. Uh, blocking in between their steel beams and uh, it clears they have to be dimension wide that it would clear the um, uh, boxes and piping that's on this the side of the structural material that uh, they uh, they build the travel lift out of 
Well, this where we're sitting right now, uh, I believe you expressed earlier, we used to be an old Cooper's uh, hut or, or um, fabrication place for the area for mostly fish and so forth. And this place probably has uh, more personality than any structure I've ever been in. Uh, how much of the personality do you think you've added to it and how much was here when you first came? Well, it was full when I came. So it's, it's so you've sort of cleared it out and organized it, Ralph. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, we don't want to do too much. It would lose its personnel. Uh, I see a lot of clever nuances. We see pictures up everywhere with memories from uh, other folks in your family. We see newspaper articles, maps. Uh, this is a, really a treasure trove of the area, and uh, thanks to you. Well, thank you. I, I enjoy it. Yes, it's obvious. Now, Lily Bay wasn't always called Lily Bay, was it? What no. was it originally? Um, I think uh, the the book I read. St. Joe's. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it was named. It was renamed by who and Meshik. why? Um, I can't tell you his first name, but Meshik uh, had a daughter. And her name was Lily, so he renamed the, when the thing was going strong here at, uh, it was Lily Bay. She, he changed it to Lily Bay. Well, here in the southeastern part of Sevastopol is uh, an area that once was a thriving, independent little community. And it was a community because uh, there was a commercial pier, some say 100 feet wide, that extended out into the lake and provided the, uh, the winter port uh, for the town of Sturgeon Bay. That's entirely right. And so how did they transport goods back and forth between Sturgeon Bay from Lily Bay. Well, the summertime it was by wagon, and the wintertime it was by sleigh. And uh, one of the biggest things that they ever accomplished down here off this one dock, it was the closest dock to Sturgeon Bay. And when they brought the steel in for the old railroad bridge, that all came over the dock here and was loaded on wagons and hauled to Sturgeon Bay. Amazing accomplishment. That's right. It's in uh, a minimum of power. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Horse and ox team. Yeah, that's right. And, and so this would have been, um, and then what caused the diminishing of its importance? Why, why did you think the community, it had like 500 residents, it had right. a sawmill, it had a cooper's house, yeah. it had a, a, a blacksmith, yeah. a little a little hotel. Right. Um, what, why do you think it diminished in its uh, popularity? Was, uh, when the um, bridge, the railroad come in, when the um, bridge the railroad bridge came in. And then the um, um, canal was dug. That was the thing that that did it for us. Uh, that uh, when the canal was dug, then uh, the ships didn't have to go around, and they could come into port, and they had protection from the storms. And that was a big item in those days because they had nothing more than sailing schooners. Yep. And so uh, about 1879, that was pretty well completed oh, and yeah. underway. Yeah. And, and yes, they um, they started in um, one of the first biggest industries in town was the canning business in uh, Sturgeon Bay. They were raising, raising peas. And uh, the Reynolds brothers had what used to be the fruit growers, and uh, that was, uh, they were hauling uh, the peas in and running them through the viners down there. Interesting. That's very interesting. So um, 
So we can we call you Smitty? Is that permissible? Okay, uh, Smitty, you've certainly uh, are adding and keeping up the tradition of this beautiful uh, old place and the and the and this beautiful warmth and character it has. How would you how would you describe life of that community of 500 back pre 1879? I mean, it would, had to be a cohesive group. They had to work very hard. They were loggers and mostly transporting wood out of here. I'm guessing. Huh? Yeah, that's about it. And uh, the mill was down by the creek, and uh, they had to work together at it. In the winter time, they'd bring their logs in. And there's an area down there that you have to see it to believe it. It's still there, where the banks are one side there about, I would say, a good 20 feet high. There's that much of a cut in that little trickle creek we got right out here. And on the other south side of the creek, they're about maybe 16 at the best from water level. And they built a dam there. They didn't have to get any permits those days. Yeah. <laughs> and they built a dam, and um, they raised that water up about eight, ten feet. And they had a place to store their logs in the winter time. They could float them down from further areas. Yeah, that, or just bring them in by sleigh and roll them off on the ice. See? Got it. And uh, <clears throat> the banks were high enough that they could just roll them off and they transported themselves down onto the, it. Uh, Clever engineering uh, feat that was. That's right, huh. by hand. Yes, <laughs> so I understand in this area also, maybe a little north of here and Shivering Sands, there was another very uh, 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 vibrant character. Um, and you, I think you said your father actually knew the man and can you, uh, his, uh, there was Wildcat in his name. What 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 was his name? <laughs> Joe Martin, the Wildcat Joe. They called him, and he uh, he was a Civil War veteran. And when he came back, he had a family, but I never heard why. Or, but he left the family on the farm, and he moved down there, and he tra trapped Wildcats, and. Uh, and he had a little garden down there, and I don't know if there's any of those, a few apple trees, and he lived out the rest of his life there at Shivering Sands by the creek. And uh, I understand he built uh, some little uh, little castle-like structure out of out of driftwood and so forth, that's right. and uh, called it uh, the 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 yeah. paradise uh, or the castle romance. Castle romance, that's correct. And uh, if, if, is it correct? Animals lived in the lower level, and then he he invited guests on the upper level. That's right. <laughs> the ducks were on the lower level. <laughs> the chickens were on the second level, and uh, he. Uh, he uh, shared one of those, I don't know which one it was, but with the ducks or the chickens, <laughs> and then the, the top was for rent out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for anybody who, who liked that, the scent of the combined uh, duck and, and chicken. And so um, he, he was quite a character. Was, it, was there just a path that went up there or no, just there was a little uh, um, trail? It's still there. We call it the Martin Road yet. Huh. And uh, it was, he had a one horse and a two wheel cart. And if he had to go to town, this is his mode of transportation. If he went to town one day, he'd come back the next because you couldn't make the round trip from back there. In uh, in one day and get his business done. Well, maybe also being sort of a hermit in in his life, a little socializing kept him in town overnight. Who knows? Yes, <laughs> Dad told a lot of stories about him, and he uh, he used to he was quite an orator. In election time, only way to get the word out is you had a by voice, and. Uh, He'd be making speeches all over town when he was in there about the election coming and and uh, who was 
running and why they were running. And uh, he uh, he had a, quite a vocabulary for uh, all the fellows running for uh, for election. So probably he was more effective in his own way than the multi-million dollar campaigns of today. That's right. That's right. How wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And so back here now in, in your clubhouse, this is this is called the Lily Bay Social, <laughs> Social Center. All right, Social Center. And uh, you meet regularly with your friends uh, once a week or twice a week? No, it's every morning at 10 o'clock. Perfect. And who makes the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have it. Oh, that's a shame. And uh, so you you come here and you meet every morning and you discuss uh, things that aren't going on today and things that are yeah. going to happen in the future and politics. We always say we settle all the problems of the world. That's good. Too bad you couldn't spread your solution out to the other people so they, they could follow through. Um, do you want to take us around uh, the, the social club and show us a few uh, uh, interesting aspects? Well, And Ralph, we have uh, before us uh, one of the many, many interesting aspects that we see here in the social club. And uh, in the social center, we've got a a whole array of tools that I'm sure that you use from time to time. And I'm picking up uh, a beautifully balanced little hammer. What is this for? <laughs> well, that's a tin hammer, a tinsmith's hammer. Uh-huh. Kind of a lost art today. Yeah, and it was here when I came, and uh, Ted Wester had it before me. And... Uh, I don't get a lot of use today, but every now and then you're looking for something like that where you can get in and yeah. tap something yeah. that uh, you wouldn't do it with a regular hammer. So, uh, Smitty, we've got a picture in front of us of a very old structure, and I believe it's very significant to Lily Bay. Um, can you tell me what that is That's and uh, how long it existed? The old boarding house, and uh, or... If you wanted to be real good to it and call it a hotel, <laughs> the uh, sailors, when they came in down at the creek, would uh, be glad to get off the boat and out of their hammocks and uh, get uh, in the boarding houses. Even if they had a straw tick, they were happy to um, lay on that they could at least lay straight instead of in a yeah. cup position yeah, in a curled up position plus the you said there was food and they could uh, be warm and uh, out of the rocky big old ship sure um, and the pier that was here you say there was like 400 feet long yeah and sometimes 100 feet wide and they would they bring the wagons right up on that pier oh yeah they drive the teams right out in the end and there was a t on the end of the pier, and you, uh, they claim it, you could take a wagon and a team of horses and turn around without backing up. So I had left quite an area there to, in order to turn a team and wagon around that you, uh, but they, uh, that pier took a lot of rough days over the years because they didn't have, um, any other way to get Sturgeon Bay? The, uh, the these piers that went up on the lake side, and the, of course Jackson Port had it, yeah. and there was one actually up on Newport as well at one time. Right. They had to be replaced rather somewhat frequently because oh, sure. of the very rough weather and the freeze and so forth. Uh, how long would these piers generally last? <laughs> they, uh, if you got three years out of them. That's about all, because the ice, the ice would come sometimes, <coughs> and uh, um, Ed Wester down here had the fish house by the lake. He he knew what kind of ice would cut the piers, uh -huh. cut the the piling off, uh -huh. and it would be sharp and thin, and then the wind would just work it a little. Yeah. And if he says he'd rather have a strong wind. It wouldn't do as much damage as one of those that cut the 
Filing off. Yeah. Oh, so you knew Mr. Wester as well? Yeah. And how long did the, his, his fish house last here? I would say they used it uh, in the 30s and the 40s. But then after that, it was just a small amount of gillnet fishing. Ah, okay. So, Ralph, here we are uh, near this beautiful wood stove, and uh, it looks like uh, an old furnace. Um, That's what it is. Okay. W what is the story behind this, Ralph? Well, this was in a apartment house in World War II at, uh, in Sturgeon Bay, and uh, they had... Uh, these apartment houses were just across the road from where the Sturgeon Bay School is now. And that's where uh, this uh, came out of one of those apartment buildings. And it's still, yeah. it's a little rough looking, but on the other hand, it's a good heating, heating unit. Well, you and I are a little rough looking, but we still work pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, I saw these other beautiful uh, rectangles, and you have piles of these around. What what are these for? These are for my crates. Okay. I make uh, half bushel and bushel crates, and they go all over the United States. No kidding. So you make these by hand, basically, part of the machine. And uh, these are the ends of the crates. Yep. And for apples, cherries? No, they, they use them for clothing more than anything else. No kidding. How wonderful. You go down and look and um, yes, yes, on yes. deck. Yeah, that's a wonderful place. Well, so, they, they well, use them all the time. And then he's got two other stores, one right. Sister Bay and one Fish Creek. How wonderful. How cool. So, so uh, what got you into this, uh, into this manufacturing of crates? Well, they, in the fall winter, things were, uh, Ted used to make them before I was here and uh, for an order. If you wanted some crates, you'd, Ted would, uh, would build your apple crates for you. But... Uh, I just made some on speculation one time, and they went pretty quick. And right now, it uh, there's quite a few of them get out of here every year. I just shipped uh, hmm. fellow was here from Florida hmm. and got some yesterday, and he was going to start a Door County. Uh, Spot in a market down there. No kidding. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> Beautifully done. Uh, we have a lot of other great things going on here in the uh, in your shed in the social club. We've got <laughs> some dimensional lumber that's uh, drying back here. You've got your wheelbarrow full of fuel to keep warm in here. <laughs> yep, that we can do. Yeah, and uh, when it's very cold, does this turn out enough therms for oh, yeah. you to keep warm in here? Sure. Good. Sure. And you've got some big uh, I told you wheel I, apparatuses. These the saws. Are the blades are. Yep. And I see and these blades. We can look at some other time, but we can clearly see you add these these uh, bits or the, the, where, the blades. Yeah, where the blades go in. And how is that attached in there, Ralph? Just uh, it's uh, there's a V. Yeah. In here. Yeah. And it rides that V, and then it bumps up against an end right there, and that seals her up. Huh. And this is the part that comes out, and then the the tooth just lays yeah. on top in the V. And and so they're different metals, obviously. Oh yeah. And do you sharpen these, or do you buy them? No, uh, we buy them, but um, we sharpen them quite a number of times. Yeah. Before we. Uh, for they shorten them up. Uh, I can show you over there yeah. on some short ones. So we have some more crates going over here. That's great. <laughs> and you've got some, these are going to be slats for the That's uh, no, Those are uh, boards for the end. And here are some completed uh, pieces. They're like fine pieces of rustic furniture. <laughs> and uh, I see the Lily Bay Box Com Mill uh, Company uh, in Door County, Wisconsin. And this is uh, what size, Ralph? That's half bushel. Half bushel. Very sturdy, beautiful item. Nicely done. 
and the wood seems nicely planed down. And this is what size? One, si one bushel. One full bushel. And again, very sturdy. It has a beautiful finish and yet the rusticness uh, that they use for displaying the clothing um, to, help, to help show their, their fine products and uh, display them to the consumers who are comfortable in knowing they're buying something displayed on a local display rack. Beautifully done. So you ship these all over. All of County, they go all over. Isn't that neat? They use them, uh, the Statses use them over here in, uh, um, for maple syrup. Oh, really? She's okay. got a, uh, an entrance coming in to her kitchen, and she's got her maple syrup there when the folks stop to, uh, to get it. You know, well, it's displayed in these boxes, and they, could, they just tip them up like this. And stack one on top of the other. Yeah. And they work like shelving. Yeah, very sturdy. So this gives the local folks another idea if they want to build a nice shelving or stereo component rack or anything yeah. like that. Sure. And we've got saws hanging, we've got pictures hanging, and this is a beautiful um, um, tree. I would call it a um, chainsaw tree, and, and we have chainsaws growing out of it. <laughs> And was that your invention, Ralph? I seen it in an implement shop. There you go. Some years ago. And we had the same problem there. Part of their floor was covered with, with saws. You couldn't walk around. You couldn't get near it. Right. And uh, so one wintry day, my oldest boy and I, Dick, I said, let's make one of those things. He, I said, just give us a little more f floor yep. room. Yep. And it's got personality, like you as well. <laughs> and it's growing right now, let's see, four saws. And yeah. it's capacity for a couple more. Oh, what, yeah. What is the lily training stick? <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Good friend of mine down the drive here, Gary Steiner. He's got a Labrador. And she's a couple years old. And... Uh, she uh, she she always has the last word when you when she she wants something. So he made this sta training stick, and he slaps it on his hand, or he reminds it when he lightly hits her or hits the stick that the stick was what <laughs> meant there you, business. There you go. <laughs> so do you manufacture those no, too and no, ship no, those around the no, world? We don't need those. No, that's great. <laughs> Um, you've got a beautiful old bench over here, and that probably came with the place. Well, that was another industry that he used to have. Huh. I still use that bench for crates, but the biggest thing uh, Ted did here, he made uh, fish boxes years ago. Okay. That was another. Yeah. Died, by the way, because it's all uh, paper nowadays. Huh. But they, uh, he, he, uh, he sold um, boxes by the hundreds, clean down to two rivers. No kidding. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And the... Uh, so it's mostly all pine. Yeah. yeah. That and popple. Yeah, yeah. Bamagilia. They were a one-way box. Right. See, yeah. They yeah. never come back. Yeah, see. yeah. So the sawdust, have we recycled that into anything special? Oh, yeah. What I've got we, guys standing in line for that. And what do they use the sawdust for? For bedding for horses. There you go. That's right. Yeah, that's right. They want the more coarse style, yeah. though, right? Shavings and sawdust, either one. They, yeah. they aren't fussy which one they get, but they want uh, it uh, soaks up the moisture right. in, in yeah, the soil. Yeah, it keeps and, it more sanitary. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, Smitty, you know, this, this corner is just so packed with history that so many of, uh, of the residents of the various uh, summer cottages and vacation areas, I'm sure, don't have any idea how significant this is. That's very true. Yeah, it's, and they drive by and they say how quaint, and they go on to their house and enjoy the lake, and that's all great. <laughs> but the, the commercial aspect of this particular corner, we were speaking previously about a fishing family called the Westers who were here, and they were very significant in this area. For During what time period, would you say? Oh, I don't have it down perfect, but they, um, Grandpa Wester, um, he was um, one of the first fishermen down here in those days, and this goes back a long time, they um, used to uh, go out to their nets and they'd row their boat out there and row it back in after mm. they lifted the nets. And he had the first motor, a one lung engine, a little gasoline engine with a, with a little line shaft in it to uh, give the boat some speed. And um, that was quite an improvement, not have to row that uh, pond net boat back in and out oh, every yeah. day. Amazing, yeah. So he had a, he he fished and did they do any uh, smoking of the fish here too or well they did a little very little uh -huh. not not too much did he ship his fish out or did he sell it locally they the they come and picked him up by boat uh huh there's a, he they told us me about a boat that used to come across from uh, Michigan and that fellow would come across he had a sailboat and he'd sail across the lake with a load of salt in uh -huh. barrels out of the mines in Michigan. And they use that to salt their fish to keep them till they got them to market. And uh, he'd, um, this fellow, <laughs> he'd, dry, he'd take orders for salt, barrels of salt. Sure. If it was eight, 10 barrels of this place, then go to Jacksonport. If they took 30 barrels, there was more fishermen there. And uh, here there was only the one establishment. And if they went to Baylor's Harbor, a lot of times he'd get rid of the whole load by the time he got, before he got Sister Bay. Yeah. Well, they didn't like to go to Sister Bay either because, because death door. Ah, going around. Contend there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they, uh, they uh, then they turn around, come back down, pick up the fish. Excellent. So That's they've cool. been salted. The, be the barrel's been emptied of the salt. The, the yep. fish was salted down and dried, and they yep. take it off to market. Yeah. Perfect. Now, besides the actual mm -hmm. lumbering for dimensional lumber, and I know after the Chicago fire in 1871, this area was just stripped clean because of the gr great lumber need, there was also uh, a development of tamarack and hemlock, and, and and the hemlock particularly was used for another purpose. They were uh, that was uh, used for when the they tan the buffalo hides in Chicago, and they'd come up here and uh, cut the hemlock and use the small ads and s score it down there as long as they cut the log, leave it lay in the sun. And the sun would shrink the bark on the hemlock so that it would fall right off. Mm. And um, they'd uh, most times they would put it in in um, get it out in two pieces so that it it nested together. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it would nest together. And uh, Ted told me uh, a couple of times about it when they used to haul it out in the summertime. On wagons, and then they hauled it to Sturgeon Bay, and uh, I don't know what means they used it to get to Chicago at that time. If they loaded it in Sturgeon Bay, because the bark went to Sturgeon Bay, I know that. If it was a train, if they had a train, I don't know. Yeah, but 
They'd ship it down there, and there they'd use it to tan the buffalo hides. So you, it wouldn't be reduced here to the to the tannin syrup, so to speak. They'd they'd bring it to whatever tanning processing plant. Yeah. I know Milwaukee had a big one called Vogel at yeah. one time. Same thing, uh, and Chicago had a big processing, um, and so th that that tannin from the from the hemlock basically cured the hides mm -hmm. and stopped it and made it, uh, they'd work it to make it pliable, pliable yeah. and also preserve it. Right. Yeah. But that kind of, they had to really take a lot of uh, trees out to, oh. to fulfill that operation, right? When I was a little shaver, I used to go with my mother. We'd take a wagon in the spring of the year and we'd go over these open sand hills that were back here and we'd pick up the knots from the hemlock mm. and they're hard as stone mm -hmm. and hot when you burn them they're oh, terrifically hot because of the density yep yeah and uh they would uh i know uh if we uh we'd pick up a wagon load of uh we called it summer wood mm -hmm. You, it would, you could light it quick, you had instant heat, then you could let it go out, and it was, uh, you didn't have that terrific heat in the kitchen. You know. uh -huh. And uh, that was before the oil stoves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was another improvement, too. So but they, um, they had um, all kinds of... Uh, possibilities, you know, to use this um, after the lumber die, uh, the, um, you got the bark off of it, then they saw some of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they get two two licks at a, mm -hmm. at a hemlock tree. Two different uh, yeah. needs and crops. Yeah. Well, we're here, uh, we're here going down memory lane and we have some Incredibly great photos of uh, people who have ventured into this uh, beautiful uh, uh, social club and uh, some friends of Ralph's. And he's going to tell us just a bit about each of these uh, memorable pictures. This is uh, Chris Larson and myself. And Chris... Uh, he got slabs from me for years when he was boiling fish at uh, the square rigger. And uh, he used to come down. I would saw the slabs up in, in uh, length that uh, they would, uh, they'd fit under his bucket and uh, for boiling. And he'd come and get it and year after year. He could just about clean out my uh, uh -huh. slab piles. Yeah. So the cake, what was the event that cake had to do? A birthday? Yeah. Uh-huh. And it had to be mine. In 2003, great picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here's a great picture of what appears to be part of the operation of the mill. And yeah, here's my oldest boy and myself. Uh, we're sawing. That's a cedar, I can see that. She's got a little tender spot on the butt end uh -huh. here. And uh, when you uh, bring them up from the time that they could do anything in the mill with you, they know as much about it as I do. Hmm. <laughs> so you, you're the master, and who <laughs> your son helps you, and who yeah. else helps you? And uh, I've got um, uh, one... The boys down on the shore here is retired from uh, um, Johnson Wax. He helps me quite a bit. He's uh, retired at 55. I think he had 30 years in. Wow. Um, Dave Barnes. That's, that's And uh, I've had uh, quite a few of the boys helping me, different fellows. And uh, they keep dropping off. It kind of scares you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ralph, this is a beautiful picture from 1997, and it shows you with 
a number of friends. Was that a particular event? I see all the antlers hanging above in the rafters. That was a, um, one of my first birthdays we had down here, and uh, there was uh, quite a few people at the birthday party, and uh, you couldn't get them all in the house. Hmm. You had to use the outside in order to, to entertain them. <laughs> well, when you have that many friends, that's going to be an overflow of your warmth. <laughs> Ralph, this is a beautiful shot of you working at the mill itself, and uh, you're concentrating on something there. Uh, I think your fingers are getting a little too close <laughs> to the blade, though. <laughs> well, that... Uh, He is in too bad a shape up here yet, <laughs> but um, he had a nice cedar log there that we're working on. Usually, make on that side log that size usually get a bunch of two by eights out of it, and they're always in demand. Yeah, yeah. Do you mill the sides hmm. down on the, on it as well? Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Here's, a, here's a beautiful shot of some harvesting activity. Uh, are those your grandkids? Those are the grandkids up above. And my oldest boy and myself on one side and Bill Wonky on the other side. And we were hauling it out in the spring. They had been snowed in. That's You can see the lo snow sticking to the logs. and We were cutting um, pine up there for... Uh, that would be for Tim's house, I think, my youngest boy. We cut and milled and um, all the lumber for the boys in Mary's house, too. Wow. And uh, it uh, helped the kids out a little bit yeah. getting started. How, how long after you cut and mill a log, say it's pine, do you need to have it? Uh, a year. A year before it should be used. Yeah. Yeah. And and that way it won't change dimensionally too That's much. That's right. Huh? Neat neat pictures. Um, well I have to I have to tell you, this is one of the most enjoyable afternoons that I've spent in a long time. <laughs> well thank uh, you. You are truly, you know, uh, in places like Japan and uh, in Ireland as a matter of fact, they have people who are considered living treasures of their culture and they look up to them and they give them special honors. Uh, I don't know what special honors could be available for you, but you are truly a living treasure of this whole area of Sevastopol, Lily, Lily Bay, um, and people driving by should, uh, should reflect on the quality of life that you live and, and the good attitude you have and the fun you have in being productive here with the sawmill. Well, it's something that you enjoy it, and you've got good friends that help you. You can't ask for more. That's right. That's right. Thank you.
Sylvester was my uncle. And I asked Carol Jean if she wanted to share anything. And she, this is one of her favorite things about the, their life. It's from the Chronicle of Historical Events in recognition of the 30th anniversary of Glidden Drive. John Wester was at rest from his many years of labor in 1970. Ed's booming voice was still in 1977, and Ted's quiet chuckle and generous nature were missed by all when he died in 1990. But that little corner of Door County will always be known as Wester's at the beginning of Glidden Drive. I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy lives to attend our presentation of the history of Lily Bay. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoyed the strawberries, they came from my good neighbor, John Shortner. If you didn't like them, I have no idea where they came from. <laughs> And now we're going to uh, announce the winner of the fish box from Lily Bay, number 67. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, 